important marks that we're looking at are the marks of biblical church discipline and discipleship, biblical church discipleship. And I want to begin by asking the question, well, let's start with a couple of scriptures. In 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bible, and want to turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. If you find it before I do and want to read it, you'd be more than welcome to do that. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-two 32 says, But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the Lord. And then in that same book, chapter 9, verse 27, we have another instance of the word discipline when Paul says, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now what have I just done? I've taken those two little verses and I've just quoted them out of context. There, I will try to give a little bit more context this way by, uh, by looking at the verses beforehand. Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper and eating and drinking the body and blood of the Lord uh, without discerning the body and the purpose of judging ourselves. And when we do that, that we would not be judged, but when we're judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. That instance of the word discipline uh, has more of the idea of, of training. We are, we are brought into right alignment by the Lord so that we're not subject to condemnation. The other instance has more to do with the idea of striking or Treating severely. You know, this is the, uh, your, what is your, your version may say, I buffet my body. That's the old King James. Not buffet, <laughs> but buffet my body, meaning to, to bring it under submission, striking it in a, in a way that, that indicates discipline. So these are just a couple of instances of the use of the word, our English word, discipline, but with two different Greek words. Uh, behind them, one the idea of training and one the idea of striking. So let me ask the question, when you hear the word discipline, what is your immediate thought as far as the connotation of that word? Ouch! Ouch! We might say that the connotation is one of pain. Is it positive or negative that you typically think of the word discipline? <laughs> it's at least discomfort. Or it might be discomforted. Discomfort. Uh, <coughs> regret. Regret. Okay. If we're being disciplined for something that we did wrong, we immediately begin to think about how maybe we ought not to do that. Is it a positive or a negative connotation? Well, that depends on whether you're the one being disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute. When, but, but didn't our parents all say, this is going to hurt me way more than it's going to hurt you? Or did they say, this is going to hurt you way more than it's going to hurt me? No, they, they understood. There's this, I'm going to say, we're 60% of this is going to be a negative connotation. Almost all the time. But, and we'll come back to that in a second, because we have to ask the question, is all discipline negative discipline? In fact, there's two different ways that we should understand when we think about church discipline. Now, again, on the negative side, most of us are going to think about what churches do to church their people. Church meaning to discipline by doing what? What's the ultimate thing that you think about when, when a church disciplines a member? Right. Right. What is Paul? Paul says in First Corinthians five, right? Uh, 
expel the immoral brother from the, uh, from the church membership. Uh, that assumes that, there's a, that there is a church membership. And that's, we talked about that a little bit last time because membership and discipline are actually related. Membership, if you'll remember, is a little bit like it draws the boundary around the people of God. It says, this is, this is the flock. This is the flock that, that the pastors, the elders, the deacons are responsible for. This is a definite number. When you close your doors and lock your shutters at night, you know who's supposed to be there. You are accounted. They are accounted for and you account for them. Um, so, discipline in the, in the fully formed negative sense or the, the corrective sense is the process of putting someone out of this, of this circle for the purpose of what? To shun them, right? To completely forget about them. No, that's never the purpose, is it? What's the purpose? That being put out may eventually bring them back to the Lord, back to the back to the local church, and back into and under the formative discipline of the assembly. So the two types of discipline are corrective and formative. We'll put them on opposite sides here to kind of get the idea. We'll, uh, we'll talk about sides here in a minute, but right now we're talking about discipline. So what's involved in formative, formative discipline? That's the spiritual formation part, right? That's what what, are the, what is a church member doing to be a better, to, to, to grow in Christ? We'll talk about discipleship here in a minute. That's the growth part. And that might be what we think of more when we think of discipleship as the formative part. But really, it's engaging in spiritual disciplines to be more conformed to the image of Christ. Things like Bible reading, prayer are part of church discipline. It's really a, a part of it. But this negative part of this corrective idea of discipline is really what he's talking about here in the section on church discipline. He writes in the, on the first page, in the narrowest sense, church discipline is the act of excluding someone who professes to be a Christian from membership in the church and participation in the Lord's Supper for serious unrepentant sin, sin they refuse to let go of. So let it be, let it be understood. Discipline, church discipline, is never for sin. If discipline were for sin, we would not have church. We would all be, <laughs> we would all be outside the circle. Discipline is for the purpose of bringing the, the sinner to repentance. And so if we're walking in repentance, if we're walking in knowing the need that we have for <coughs> forgiveness and we are consistently letting go of those sins that so easily beset us, and we're engaged in self-discipline, right? That's, the, that's what Paul was talking about when he said, I beat my body or I discipline my body in submission. It's the self-discipline, and that's really the first level of church discipline, isn't it? Is that self-discipline. And then it goes on to, uh, if, if someone is in, Serious unrepentant sin, and then if that becomes known. What is the person? What is the church supposed to do? Well, whoever knows about it wants to go to the person. If it's a private thing between you and them, you go between you and them, and you discover, okay, what's going on here, Matthew 18 style. Talk to them about that. See if they will come back. If they don't, you take two or three others, because by the mouths of two or three witnesses will everything be established. If they, don't, if they still refuse to repent, you take it to the church. But that might mean a, a church meeting like this. It might mean the entire assembly. It could, mean, it could mean just the leadership of the church. That might be an extra uh, semi-step in there, just depending on the circumstances of it. But there's, there's a 
process, isn't there, for that church discipline? So someone is, is uh, if you know someone who has, is in sin, you don't immediately take it to the church unless it happened, unless the offense happened before the, you know, before the assembly. So if someone stands up in the assembly of the church and commits a sin, I'm trying to think of a good one that might happen on a Sunday morning. If they stand up and turn the air blue with a streak of profanity for no apparent reason, and they call the, the, the church out with all kinds of vulgar language, do we have to say, okay, now Matthew says I've got to go to that person privately first, and I've got to take to it? No. You don't have to go to that person privately. You can immediately say, I rebuke, and the church rebukes that action, and we could, they could immediately be brought up before the assembly to say, what you're doing, brother, is absolutely sinful and you need to repent of it. There's no need to go through step one and step two. Why? Because it was public. And so the discipline begins at whatever level the, the whatever level the sin was. If it was private, then you do you go to the private. And if it happened in a small group, it's essentially Whatever that group was, whatever the individual was or the group was, that's where the discipline would start. So if something happens in a, uh, let's say a small group like a Sunday school, you don't have to say, okay, we got to go. Prudence may mean that you go to that person privately, depending on the, the issue, but it's possible and it's, and it's biblical to say right then, no, brother, what you are doing or saying is either biblical or it's sinful or it's heretical. You know, I'm thinking of the thing that would happen in a Sunday school class would be probably more, or a small group would be probably more along the lines of someone going off into doctrinal error, right? Someone says something in a Sunday school class like, well, you know, I don't really believe Jesus is God. Don't take that as a, don't take that as a clip. I'm saying, I'm using this as an example. Those of you who are watching this, happen to be watching it on YouTube understand my context here. If someone says in the context of a Sunday school class, you know, I don't really believe that Jesus is God, then the leader or the others in that group had the responsibility to do what? Exercise corrective discipline for, for wrong doctrine and say, oh, I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, sister. What we, we need to do is correct that thought or that idea because the Bible very clearly teaches and Jesus himself claims many, many times to be God. So you don't have to, you don't have to say, well, after, after class, I guess we better talk. No, at that point, you can say with love, with prudence, with uh, discretion in a way that doesn't bring shame on the person, unless they're particularly trying to, to derail or lead the class astray, then you can do it in a loving way. What if that person is the teacher? What's that? Then the class better be acting. The class had better. In fact, <coughs> what does the scripture say about let not many of you become teachers? Why? Because you will be held to a stricter account. Meaning, we'll deal with you differently than we deal with the average member. You could, I could envision a, a scenario where someone might, in a class, might say something, just a member might say something that's a little bit off, and afterwards you could say, hey, we need to, kind of like, uh, uh, was it uh, Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos, took him aside and explained the way to him more fully, and he accepted the fullness of the way, where he, all he had known was the baptism of John. So they did, even then, in a situation where he was teaching, didn't feel like it was prudent, didn't, didn't believe it was prudent to do in the assembly, call him out. They understood, hey, he hasn't got the whole facts here. So even in, the, in a teacher like that, they took him aside. So prudence has to, has to rule there, and, uh, and the context of that, of that situation will determine how discipline is exercised. And we have to have wisdom along the way. Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, give us that to, Give us that. This, ha this sounds a lot like judging, doesn't it? One of the things, one of the questions that he asks is, Shall thou judge? What's the most favorite scripture of this generation? Did you all log out? 
it's Matthew 7, 1. As it used to be John 3, 16. Now it's Matthew 7, 1. Judge not lest you be, lest you be judged. Or that you be not judged. Uh, they, most of the time it's not taken in context because that is a passage about the proper exercise of judgment. And what is, what is the scripture say about judgment? Where does it begin? In the house of God. So there has to be judgment going on within the body. But do we judge those outside, those in the world? No. No. We are in this world. We are not of the world. And we allow those who are of the world to be of the world. What happens a lot of times when, uh, when we see things happening in our culture that make us just shake our head and think, what is our world coming to? Whenever you have to find yourself asking yourself that question, know this, you already have the answer. We know what this world is coming to. We've read the back of the book. We know. Even before you get to Revelation, when you get to Peter, <coughs> what does he say? There's coming a day, the day of the Lord, the elements, the, the, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. This is, gonna, this is going to be uh, an incendiary baptism the very end of uh, on, the, on the day of the Lord and everything's going to be burned up essentially and everything has will have to be made new. New heavens, new earth, and we see that in Revelation, of course. So we know what the world is coming to. Why, why should we expect the world to live at the level that we live or with the knowledge that we have or with the, the uh, morals that we have? We're not judging on the outside, but we are really commanded to judge on the inside. That's the way it works. The discipline that happens has to be within the loving character of God. I love what he says on page 102. Why discipline? So that the holy and loving <coughs> character of God might appear more clearly and shine more brightly. He's talking about it in the context of why he would polish a mirror. And we don't polish mirrors probably anymore. But in the old days, you know, mirrors might be made of, of, uh, of metal, and you'd have to polish it to get the to get the uh, to remove any specks and and, uh, and that kind of thing. Even today, you clean a mirror, you get the junk off, you get the the uh, uh, dirt off, so that it can be used, and so that it can be an accurate reflection. That's what the church is supposed to do: is to be a reflection and a display of God's glory. One of the ways that the church does that is by exercising discipline. He talks here about, he mentions, and I know the book he's talking about, he mentions this idea of one church growth expert wrote several years ago a book called Opening the Front Door, or Opening, yeah, opening the Front Door. And his idea was get the front door of the church open wide and close off the back door. Allow as many people in to the church through as many avenues and close off the back door so you don't lose people. Deborah takes a little bit different approach and says, take that front door and guard it carefully. And then open the back door for those who are not true believers, for those who are not uh, truly in the flock, so that you're so that the church isn't uh, filled up with unbelievers. Um, this happens unintentionally, I think, with, with churches, at least it's been my experience, that you have someone who comes in and make a profession of faith. They, you might never have seen it before. They make a profession of faith, the church votes on them, they're, they're baptized, they're admitted to membership, all that can happen within the course of a week or two, and then you never see them again, and 15 years later they're still on the church roll, and you go, what happened? Well, we didn't guard the front door. And we closed off the back door so that they're, they're, we're still carrying them. We're still carrying you know, a name, but it doesn't really mean much because they're not a part of the church. There's discipline that can happen uh, both on the front end and the back end. Uh, if you were with us in the Pilgrim's Progress study earlier this year in the summer, you found out how Pilgrim described this process of being admitted to the 
church and being part of the church membership and the importance of that and the importance of asking questions multiple times to make sure that the church was a believing church, that it was made up of uh, believers, but also that it was g genuinely converted people who were committed to the Lord, not just those who had a said faith or were converted verbally and not in actuality. He defines biblical church discipline over on 106 as simple obedience to God and a confession that we need help. I think there's some value in understanding that when we when we talk about this as corrective discipline, we're trying to obey the Lord. Is there? We've been, I've been talking with our deacons about um, this very subject. I've had them listen to a podcast about this subject. When when it's not right, when, why you should and when you should practice church discipline. And one of the things that uh, is said on there is. Don't go full on into corrective discipline until you've until the church has been trained to understand what first of all biblical church membership is and what that discipline involves. Because it can create a lot of misunderstandings. You can well imagine. Uh, all you have to do is look at the church minutes from 100 or 150 years ago, different churches that practice discipline for sometimes for very Light reasons, and they would put people out of the church. They would um, excommunicate them for things that were seen. They would excommunicate them for sin without giving them the opportunity to actually repent. Oh, so and so was seen at such and such dance hall on you know, a certain time, so they they just excommunicated them. And maybe they, maybe someone went and talked to them. I don't know. But that seems to be the gist of, of that. That leads us into the next mark, which is this mark of discipleship. And I wrote a line to it because we weren't talking about it then. Any questions, though, on, on discipline, thoughts on discipline, or from the chapter that you might have read? How do we know when Christians are growing in grace? This is page 108. 
We don't ultimately know from the fact that they're excited, use the <coughs> religious language, or have a growing knowledge of Scripture. Just because they exhibit an increased love for the church or display confidence in their own faith isn't determined either. We can't even be sure Christians are growing because they appear to have an outward zeal for God. All these may be evidences of true Christian growth. At the same time, one of the most important and most commonly overlooked signs of growth that must be observed is increasing holiness rooted in Christian self-denial. It gives a couple of scriptures there. I don't know if someone could look up James chapter 2, verses 20 through 24, and just read it right out. And also someone on 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. James. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was acted together with his works, and by works faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. James. You see that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Alright, so there's works involved there that, that, that help uh, someone not to be justified in God's sight, but to be justified in whose sight. The justification that James is talking about is being justified in the eyes of the watching world. And so, and then 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. Church life, 
when we think about growth, we think about numbers. If everything's up and to the right on the chart, you know, here's the chart. And here's the trajectory. If everything's up and to the right, everything's going good. If everything's going like this, you know, attendance is down, the offerings are down, whatever, everything's down, then we think, oh, that's negative growth. So that's not, you know, that's, that's decline. And this is, this is increase on the other side. Let me ask you this. Is it possible to have an increased number of people involved in attendance and an increased number of dollars in the coffers and a decrease in Christian growth? See it happen. We've actually seen it happen within Christianity. I I wish that I couldn't, but I can list a whole. I could list a whole page full of churches and ministries that have gone down this route to do what Spurgeon called entertaining the goats instead of feeding the sheep, and it results. It can result in. Bigger and better and, and everything as far as the numbers go, and yet result in a paucity of spiritual health. That's why we're talking about a healthy church, not big church. Or healthy church, not church growth necessarily. Now, the growth that we're talking about that in the he talks about here can be can be measured in different ways. I love the ways that he talks about here. What growth does and doesn't look like on 109. This will be the last thing that we, that we really talk about. If you've got your book there, I'm just going to take a few moments and, and read through these. He says, when you peer into the life of a church, the growth of its members can show up in all sorts of ways. Here are a few of the possibilities. I've, I've marked up in my book a very helpful list 